Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Justin Nestery. I am an associate professor here at Rice University. And today we're going to talk about convergence checking and model fit assessment in Bayesian models. Uh, there are three questions that uh, are motivating this uh, lecture video, one of which uh, we've talked about before in a previous video for this class. The first question is, how do I know that the samples of some parameter that are generated for my computational sampling procedure, which in Bayesian methods typically means a Gibbs sampler, though not always, are really representative of the unknown distribution f of theta? This is a question we've talked about before. We talked about it in the class that, or in the video, that pertain to practical MCMC. Uh, another asking the same question is, how do I know that my Gibbs sampler has achieved a limiting distribution equivalent to f of theta? And so in this case, f of theta is the target density, uh, the target density of the parameter I'm interested in. Uh, theta in this case is some, you know, perhaps a slope coefficient in a hierarchical linear model, or maybe a mean, or maybe a difference of means if I'm simulating that. We have talked about this question before. Uh, we're going to address it again, uh, in part because there are some different techniques that we can use to tackle this question we should talk about. But also, and perhaps more importantly, uh, because if you uh, suspect that your sampler is not working well, uh, the question becomes, what can I actually do about that? And it turns out there are some things we can do about it. They're discussed in Gelman and Hill in, in BDA3, the, the other Gelman Bayes' textbook, uh, and in, in the Jackman textbook. Uh, techniques like hierarchical centering or parameter expansion uh, that can help your uh, Gibbs sampler do better. And I think the key here, uh, one of the key things other than sort of, if I have this problem, how do I solve it? Another thing that we're gonna talk about is sometimes your Gibbs sampler uh, cannot be working correctly uh, even though it uh, appears via convergence diagnostics to be working fine. In other words, sometimes these convergence problems are actually a, a little bit subtle. And so it, it, it bears repeating, uh, the topic bears repeating because it, it's not always uh, as easy as it, as it seems to assess whether uh, a Markov chain has really converged by simply looking at a trace or looking at a GWIKI diagnostic or something. So that's the first question we'll talk about. Uh, the second question we'll talk about is, uh, presuming my sampler is working well, how can I tell whether a model is a good fit to the data set? This is not a problem, uh, this is not addressing a problem you might have with the sampling procedure. It's assessing a problem you might have, <coughs> excuse me, with respect to your model structure. Most Bayesian models that I can think of at least are fairly parametric. For example, a hierarchical, hierarchical linear model is pretty structured, right? It has a hierarchical structure with linear or perhaps some polynomial relationship at each level, and there's a lot of structure going on in there. Are there uh, reasons to suspect, or I guess one way of thinking about this is, how do I tell if my model is meaningfully misspecified? And so there's some things we can talk about there. We can talk about posterior predictive densities, fit assessment, out of sample uh, checking, like cross-validation, so various things we can talk about. Uh, and then finally, uh, if I have multiple plausible models that might explain the data generating process, how do I decide which one is the most credible model? And what I mean here is how do I decide using empirical evidence? Of course, you could invoke theory to say, well, this is the best one. But we're in a situation here for this question where theory may say there are several possible theoretically plausible models. Perhaps all of them appear to predict the, uh, sort of visually speaking, have similar residual, similar fit qualities. How do I decide which one is the most credible model? And so in particular, we're going to talk uh, about base factors and the deviance information criterion in assessing which one is the most credible model. So those are the three questions we're going to talk about. Uh, let's start by talking about uh, uh, sampling and convergence assessment, some different diagnostics and some problems you might run into while you're running a Gibbs sampler on a model. All right, so you're running a Gibbs sampler to sample out of the parameter space of some Bayesian model you're interested in. You want to know how to assess whether the sample is producing samples of theta, a parameter of interest, that are representative of f of theta the target density, the true density 
um, in the data or in the data generating process, hopefully in the data generating process. We have assessed this question before, uh, in particular in the lecture uh, titled Practical MCMC for Estimating Models. So there are four things you uh, presumably already know how to do. And I notice I'm misspelled Heidelberger here. That's right. You can look visually at the Markov chain. You can plot sort of the evolution of theta over time. If there are multiple thetas, you can plot them against each other and visually assess whether the theta is mixing well or whether it seems to get stuck at a certain spot or whether it moves slowly through the space. And that's actually a pretty good way of getting at whether the chain is working. And I would say up to this point in the class, if you're following along with the class and the videos and whatnot, uh, that's probably the way you've been using and it's perfectly reasonable. You may have also been using three uh, formal diagnostics, the Gawicki, Raftery, and Lewis, and Heidelberg diagnostics, Heidelberger diagnostics. Those are all uh, reasonable approaches as well. They essentially look at various ways of whether the chain is moving around and whether the mean of the chain is moving around in the space or whether, you know, different chains are producing the same result or different pieces of the chain are producing the same result or some version of that. I'm not going to cover all that stuff again. There's a video that is just as good as it ever was <laughs> that you can look at to see those things. I do want to talk about another diagnostic that I didn't talk about that uh, in that earlier video, the Gelman and Rubin diagnostic. This is called Gelman.diag in the CODA package in R. So all three of these courier new font labels and this courier new font label refer to commands in the CODA package in R that you can use to estimate the diagnostics. This is sometimes called R hat or the potential scale reduction factor. Those all mean the same thing. According to Gelman and Hill, and this I'm quoting them in this case. In fact, I think I'm quoting them on page, if I have it open to the page. Eh, I don't have the page open. This is a quote from the book. For each parameter, the possible reduction in the width of the confidence interval were the simulations to be run forever. That's what the PSRF or R hat means. It's essentially to what extent will we expect reduction in the confidence interval if the simulations were to be extended. And they tell, they say, again, in, in the Gilman and Hill, just to plug the book here, uh, they say in that book that the target uh, quantity for the statistic should be less than 1.1. We can also talk about what mathematically this convergence statistic means. This comes out of BDA3. This is the, the red book, the other Gilman et al. Bayesian Data Analysis 3rd Edition. Um, they describe the statistic in somewhat greater detail. So suppose I have a parameter of interest called psi. That's the notation in the book. M is the number of chains. You have to have multiple chains to be able to estimate this diagnostic. N is the number of samples per chain. And essentially what the Gelman and uh, Rubin diagnostic is going to do, it's going to estimate the within variance. This right here, this, where's my pen? This W right here is the within variance of samples in a chain, and this B down here is the between variance of samples in the chain. So this W quantity is essentially how much movement or dynamism there is on average in your different chains. You'll notice there are M many chains, and what we're doing is we're averaging inside of the chains the chain level variation. This is the average of chain level variance. So S sub J squared is chain level variance. So if we sort of break this down, this is parameter, a parameter estimate, a sample. In chain J, we're taking the average quantity of each sample minus its expectation squared, and then summing that up and dividing by 1 over minus 1, that's a variance estimator. So essentially, all this is is just the variance in chain J. You'll notice this quantity here is defined as, this is just 
e of psi in chain j. Right, summing that up. And so we're, this, is, this is a variance estimation. 1 over m tells us uh, we have, we're adding up this variance quantity for all the different chains. We're taking an average level of that among the chains. So it's an, av it's a, it's an average variance. I feel like I might be repeating myself. <laughs> then the between variance, appropriately enough, I suppose, is the degree to which the chains are different from one another. In essence, how much are the samples in chain J1 or yeah, J, J1 equal to the samples in chains J, J, chain J0? And so what we're doing there is, again, taking the expected value of the estimates in one particular chain, the expected value of psi in one particular chain, and subtracting that from the grand mean estimate of the chain, squaring that, and then dividing by this quantity. Again, this is this is a variance estimate, right? So this is this is the within variance. This is the between variance. And you may, if you studied uh, for example, um, time series cross-section data analysis, if you've done some stuff with panel models, you may remember that between variance and within variance among panels is very important for determining what's going on in your panels. Similarly, this, I, I, I wouldn't say similar, maybe analogously, this is telling us how much variation there is within chains, how much variance there is between chains, just like there would be assessing variance within and between panels. Uh, finally, we compute this statistic, uh, the variance or the estimated variance of the parameter given the data equal to m minus 1 over n w plus 1 over n b. And given that all these chains ought to be converging to the same limiting distribution, one would believe, as n goes to infinity, you might notice we expect this quantity to go to w, right? Because n goes to infinity, n goes to infinity, so this essentially becomes a form of 1. Although dividing infinity by infinity is a little tricky, but we can essentially say this is equal to 1. 1 over n is going to go to 0. So this is going to approach w as n goes to infinity. And you can see, this is also noted in, in the BDA3 book, as n goes to infinity, r hat, our final convergence statistic, is also going to go to 1 because this denominator, or I'm sorry, this numerator is going to go to w, and then the denominator is going to be w, and then you get square root of 1, which is 1. Typically, for n less than infinity, and n is always less than infinity in practice, this number is going to be bigger than w, which is kind of obvious. You've got a fraction of w, and then the rest of the fraction is the between variance. As n goes to infinity, this fraction approaches w. Um, for n's less than infinity, it's bigger than w. Ergo, this number is going to be bigger than 1, generally. So you might remember up here, the target is less than 1.1. So you might think about this as a measure of to what extent are these chains in a variance perspective to what extent are these chains similar to one another? And the more similar they are, the closer this r hat statistic gets to 1. So ideally, you want them to actually be 1, or very, very close to 1. So that's the Gelman and Rubin convergence statistic. You can sort of file that away with the other ones that you thought about. Unfortunately, I have some bad news. <laughs> the bad news is that the Gelman and Hill diagnostic, I'm sorry, the Gelman and Rubin diagnostic, the Raftery diagnostic, the Kawiki diagnostic, all these diagnostics can sometimes yield misleading results. And it's a little easier to see this in practice than it is to describe it, but I will describe it briefly and then show you an example. Describing it briefly, what I would say is occasionally a chain appears to be mixing pretty well inside of a, spa a parameter space, psi or theta or whatever, and it is, but it's not mixing in all portions of the space. So in essence, it's converging to a distribution that is a subset of the total density of f of f of psi in this case, or f of theta, and theta is the parameter name. And that's a problem. We want to explore the full space 
of psi or theta. We don't want to explore some subspace of psi or theta. And this problem can exist in some very subtle ways that are hard to detect using these convergence, diagnost convergence diagnostics and even visually. So what I want to do now is I want to show you a, an example of this problem using the radon data set. Um, and that's going, to con that's going to transition pretty well into talking about the a potential answer to this uh, problem, namely parameter expansion and hierarchical centering. I want to note uh, and give some credit where credit is due. Uh, this example comes from Thomas Wiecki. He's guy I put his little GitHub website here, which is pretty neat. It's got a nice little blog. And it involves the radon data set that Gelman and Hill and the ARM, uh, ARM is short for data analysis using regression and multi-level hierarchical models, I guess analysis using regression and multi-level. That's a pretty short acronym. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> in the ARM textbook, this radon example comes up a lot. So it ties in well with the readings and it ties in well with the sort of a very commonly known thing. So let's take a look at this radon data set and show how you can have a convergence problem that is somewhat hidden. All right, so uh, I've got R Studio open here uh, with some uh, with an example pertaining to the radon data set that is um, available in uh, all over the internet, uh, linked to the um, Gelman and Hill book on hierarchical regression modeling. And uh, this specific example um, of a convergence issue comes from a, a blog post. Uh, whoops right here, uh, by uh, Thomas Wiecki. And I've modified that example a little bit. Uh, first of all, he's using a Python-based uh, sampler. I also think he's using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo as opposed to uh, a Gibbs sampler. Uh, but the, the basic principles and, and issues and convergence problems associated with the model are, are all the same. So the first thing I want to do, I'm going to set my uh, session or my working directory, rather, to the uh, location of my script and my data. I'm going to remove uh, everything that's in the everything that's in the memory. I'm going to load in my data set. I'm dropping observations that have uh, these are actually missing data. So, and if you just look at what this data is, it's a bunch of uh, every observation is a house or a building. Uh, and the dependent variable of interest is the level of radon, a radioactive gas, in the house at the place where the measurement was taken. And so I eliminated all the observations for which floor was uh, greater than or equal to 8 because, as, at least as far as I can tell, 9 in the original data set indicates a missing value. Either that or, <clears throat> for some reason... There appear to be a lot of ninth floor <laughs> observations, so I'm I'm guessing that that's a missing uh, that's a missing value. So uh, what we're going to do is following the examples in Gelman and Hill, and also this example on on uh, Wiecki's blog, we're going to narrow this down to only looking at uh, observations from the state of Minnesota. And these two lines here create uh, they transform the county variable into from a name into a numerical index, which is very helpful in terms of, for example, indexing random effects or random slopes if we choose to do that, which we are going to do. Then I'm just going to load in a bunch of useful R libraries for accessing JAGs and various diagnostic procedures in, in, um, in Bayesian models and in Gibbs sampling. Uh, I'm going to compute N and K, where N is the number of observations in the data set, and K is the number of counties, unique counties in the data set. And then I'm going to run my model, and here, here's my model. Now, the, the trick of this model is it looks fine. It looks completely ordinary. It's a basic hierarchical model with random slopes. Here's the random slopes right there. And random intercepts. So the, the full model of radon, which is the independent, or I'm sorry, the dependent variable in this case, is there's a common intercept, there's a random effect on the intercept by county, so certain counties owing to their geography or location or whatever have higher or lower radon levels, and there's also a coefficient on floor, so where the measurement was taken in the house is relevant to the observation, you, to the 
value of radon you get, the concentration of radon you get. I believe actually the measurement is log parts per million or something like that. And then uh, B here is the uh, slope on floor, and it also randomly varies by county. So different counties essentially have stronger or weaker relationships between radon level and floor. And without going into a ton of detail about <laughs> what radon is and how it works, radon comes out of the ground and seeps into your house and basements are especially vulnerable. So sometimes people put radon detectors in their basement. And the idea is the measurement may be stronger in a lower floor and less strong or smaller in a higher floor. And the geographic characteristics of the county will depend on, will, will influence rather, how much radon comes out of the ground. So it's a very simple model. We've got some hyper distributions on eta, which is the random effect. We're assuming that the variation uh, in eta, the random effect, is diffuse. I, I have very diffuse prior values about this. The d gamma 0.1.1 is a very diffuse prior distribution. Could make it more diffuse, I suppose, by making it 0.001, but I don't think that's going to change my results much. And all I've done here is uh, I've converted the precision, because JAGS likes precisions and not variances. i am converted the precision to a standard deviation by multiplying tau to the negative one-half power. So negative square root, or one, I'm sorry, one over the square root of tau, which is sigma. That's a more normal sort of quantity that I think a lot of statisticians and applied statisticians more familiar with. I know I certainly am than compared to precision. Then I've got my slope hyper distribution here. The slopes have some common mean. It's zero. The slopes have some variation around them. It's also zero. Uh, I'm sorry, it's also diffuse, just like the, the distribution on the random effects. I'm converting the variance, I'm sorry, the precision of the random effects into a sigma, just like I did before. This is my hyper distribution on the standard deviation of the regression. It's actually the precision of the regression. It's a measure of how much noise there is in the data. I'm putting a very diffuse expectation on that. And then finally, I'm presuming, and this is sort of where I explicitly specify where the slopes and the intercepts come from, I'm assuming that the slopes are randomly distributed around zero with this precision tau eta, and that the, I'm sorry, these are the, these are the uh, random intercepts are distributed with a mean of zero and a variant or precision of tau eta, and the random slopes are distributed around some common mean, non-zero, uh, with a uh, precision of tau beta. Now my prior is centered for this, for these slopes are centered on zero, right? So my prior expectation is no slope, but that's also a very diffuse expectation. So the, you can see here the precision on that on that prior on that hyper prior there is extremely low or is extremely small. So essentially, it's almost a flat. It's not quite flat, but it's a very flattish expectation. So I'm allowing. I'm basically saying I don't have much prior knowledge on on what the relationship between um, floor and radon levels will be. But my highest expectation is zero. So in fact, I I think in in terms of organizing this model, it might be a little more appropriate to put this up here because now you can see I've got A, that's my basically overall data mean, not including the random effects. Here's the random effect intercepts centered on zero because they actually are going to be clustered around A. Here's my random slopes. They're clustered on mu beta, which is the grand mean slope averaging over all the counties. And then the rest of the stuff is hyperdistribution. The order you put it in in bug doesn't matter. The order is just, in this case, mostly for your own reading benefit. That might be a little bit easier way to read it. So that's a model, very ordinary looking model. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to run it in JAX. I'm gonna estimate, draw samples from the distribution of eta given the data, A given the data, and mu B and B given the data. And you may see here, so I'm specifying what parameters I'm gonna draw. Here's all these ones I mentioned. I'm also pulling out one of the beta, one of the slopes in particular I'm pulling out. It's the 70, it's the slope for the 75th county. This is the one that Wiecki chose in, in his demonstration 
could have easily chosen a bunch of different ones. This just was the one he used, so I figured I would use it too. And what I'm gonna do is now draw some samples from the distribution, uh, the posterior distribution of all these different parameters. And then I'm going to do some basic diagnostic work to see how I did. So first let's look at an MCMC plot of, of the chains from the Gibbs sampler, and it's pulled up right here. So let's take a look at this. This is the overall intercept, right? The sort of not including the random effects and assuming that the value of floor is zero, which I believe corresponds to a basement in this data. Chains look like they're mixing pretty well. ACL plot's not bad. Same for mu beta. Basically the same for sigma beta and sigma eta. There's tau beta. You know, visually, these chains look fine to me. I don't see sort of intrinsically any convergence issues. If I was looking at this, I'd say probably we're fine. Uh, but I might want to look at some, some diagnostics. So here's the Gelman diagnostic that we talked about earlier. Wow, all ones, which is exactly what they should be. So feeling good. Uh, you could do the Heidelberger. Maybe we could do the Gwiki here. Yeah, this mu beta one in this chain seems particularly high. Maybe the sigma beta seems a little high. Uh, but overall, not much going on in the way of the z-scores. And then if I look at the Heidelberger, looks like all the tests are passed. So diagnostics are telling me everything's okay. All right, so I'm going to combine. I, you may notice when I drew these when I drew these samples, I specified three chains, and I need more than one in order to compute the Gelman diagnostic, Gelman and uh, Rubin, I believe, diagnostic. Um, I'm going to combine those into one, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct a plot of draws from the distribution of sigma beta, or the uh, the standard deviation of the random slopes, and one particular value of beta, the beta for the 75th county. Probably don't care much about the 75th county. That's not really why I'm doing this. I'm doing this to show you there's an interesting pattern here. And the pattern is, as sigma b drops, the samples of b of beta for the 75th county get narrower, which kind of makes sense. As the sigma beta, which is the variation in beta, tends to drop, the degree to which any individual beta is deviating from the grand mean is smaller. Ergo, its variance goes down. It's literally a measure of the variance of that parameter. You can see this pattern even more starkly if instead of looking at sigma, you look at tau, the precision. And here we've got sort of an inverted funnel, whereas the precision of beta goes up, the variation in betas goes down. Believe it or not, this is indicative of a potential problem. And the problem we're facing here is as beta, I'm, I'm sorry, as tau beta gets bigger and bigger, so the precision of beta gets bigger and bigger, there's less and less variation in, in beta here. And it's hard for the Gibbs sampler to fully get up into this sort of narrow funnel and fully explore the space of possible values for beta. The slope, in this case, beta is the slope on the relationship between floor and radon levels. And if I look specifically, actually, let's take this one. This is a plot of the density, the posterior density of sigma b, sigma beta, given the data. You can see that it, it seems to be focused on about 0.3. That's about the mode. And then it kind of drops off and doesn't explore much in zero, around zero, which corresponds to, if you go back to this plot, uh, this plot right here, zero of, a, a sigma beta of zero is a really big tau. It's a tau of, you know, 100 or 1,000 or something really large. This could be a problem. It could be the case that the sampler is not getting into this region of sigma beta and therefore, we are overstating the extent to which there is detectable random variation in the slopes across counties. It's, a, it's an artifact of the sampler itself. There's nothing wrong intrinsically with the model, 
The problem we're encountering is that the model is structured in such a way that the sampler can't get to all the values of theta. And the reason for that is, going back to this, let's make this uh, tau diagram here. If I have a beta that's, there we go, that's sort of in this range, I'm never going to get to a tau that's very large. In order to get to a tau that's very large, I have to be very, very close to the mean value of beta. So as the sampler is moving around in here, it's just very unlikely to get, first of all, the right draw of beta, and then to get a very big proposal of tau. So it's having a hard time exploring it. That doesn't mean that this chain is defective in the sense that if we let it run forever, if n went to infinity, it would fully explore the space. But any computer doesn't actually simulate for infinity number of draws. <laughs> we simulate for a finite number of draws. In this case, I simulated 20,000 draws out of three chains, so a grand total of 60,000 draws. I'm still not getting, possibly, it could be a problem. It's not always a problem, but it could be a problem. I'm not getting full exploration of this space. So, if we believe that there are convergence problems in this, in the uh, radon model that we uh, just looked at, what can we do to fix that? Uh, well, the generic problem, uh, as it's described by Gelman and Hill and Gelman et al. and Jackman and various sources online, is that when uh, two parameters in a Bayesian model are very closely correlated, it can cause the sampler to encounter problems exploring specifically the space of the parameter that you're trying to sample from. So it, it, you don't get values of theta from your sampler that represent the full uh, posterior distribution of theta. And the generic solution is to try to uh, break the correlation between uh, the parameters uh, that you're interested in. So uh, when, for, as one example, when you're studying a, a distribution of theta, uh, which is a normal distribution function of two parameters, mu and tau, for a vector valued theta, uh, and this can be uh, theta as a vector of random intercepts or a bunch of random slopes for n many units. Um, it can be the case that the sampler has trouble fully exploring the theta space uh, for very uh, small, uh, it should be, or large. Uh, I, actually, I guess this should be very small values of sigma uh, or very large values of tau. So when precision is very high or variance is very low. And this is this, this, this funnel you get into where you, the sampler cannot move around the space because, uh, let's see here, if we just sort of replicate what we were just looking at, you get a, a situation where we're looking at tau here and we're looking at some particular theta and the, the density looks like this. Uh, and uh, the problem is that the sampler can't really get into, uh, let's see, as the sampler is moving around in here, it just has a very hard time uh, getting into that funnel because the Gibbs sampler, for example, right here, if it were to propose a value of tau there, it wouldn't move to that, right? So it has to, in order to be, to get into that space, it has to really be sort of right here. And, you, and then you have to get a very large proposal of tau to get there. So you might get lucky and it might sort of work its way up into here, but you need to get lucky. Um, and it, it, as, as the number of draws goes to infinity, that will happen. It'll do that. It'll, it'll search that portion of the space. But the time required to get there could be uh, longer than you want to spend waiting for a Gibbs sampler to run. So instead, uh, so in this case, we got correlation between the parameter and the precision, and we need to uh, break that. Uh, we need to break the relationship between the parameter value or its mean value maybe, and uh, the precision. So um, one idea, uh, and this idea comes out of a, a blog post uh, that we talked about earlier by Wiecki, uh, is to um, essentially rewrite, um, how to put this, you, you uh, rewrite the uh, distribution so that um, you have an offset value right here and then uh, the mean and then the parameter is equal to its mean plus 
uh, it's this offset value times the uh, variance of the parameter. And what happens here is this allows uh, proposals uh, for the variance parameter to vary um, much more freely. So sigma and tau are, of course, inverses of each other. Uh, so sigma squared is the inverse of tau more specifically. So by allowing sigma to you to get these sort of bigger or smaller proposals of sigma, you get more up into this space of tau right here, and then as, as uh, theta moves around, you're more likely to get a proposal of tau that's further up in this space. So just to sort of work this out visually, um, the scale of sigma is varying according to this, this offset parameter. So when the offset parameter, let's say, is really small, like zero, near zero, uh, you might get a, a proposal uh, for tau that's pretty large, right? So your proposal might be here. And in the rescaled version, that actually does lie because the, the, when it's rescaled, it's actually down here. That does lie sort of in the likelihood funnel. But then when the offset value suddenly blows up, right, so that now tau is sort of pushed up into here, as if, if, if uh, theta happens to be in this range, you'll actually accept that value of theta and your value of tau will stay the same when the offset value blows up. So uh, I'm not sure I'm explaining this as clearly as I could, but let me try another tactic. Um, basically what you're allowing to happen here is you're allowing sigma or tau to be rescaled a lot um, in a way that's not correlated with anything. It's just sort of correlated with this offset value that you've created. And in a lot of cases, when that rescaling happens, you may accept the value of tau that's been blown up or shrunk down really rapidly uh, as long as you're sort of sitting in the right theta space. So in other words, if I start like with a, a theta and a tau combination right here, and then suddenly I get blown up to a tau up here by this change of this offset parameter, I might accept that. And so it's, it's sort of forcing the, the draws into the, uh, to, 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 to go into that funnel. Um, and it breaks up, the, uh, to some degree, the correlation between the current value of theta and the current value of tau, and relatedly, the, the value of the mean and the value of, uh, of the current value of tau, or sigma. Um, so that's, that's one idea, and that's the idea advanced um, in the Wiecki blog post that I mentioned a second ago. Um, another, uh, another possible... Um, Idea and this is one advanced by Gelman and Hill and Gelman et al. in the in the hierarchical models and Bayesian data analysis books respectively, is to um, rewrite these parameters instead of being um, mean, having some mean and having some variance, to rewrite them as essentially demeaned parameters, and then calculate these adjusted parameters. And these adjusted parameters essentially force uh, a force the random effects to take on one of the characteristics of random effects to be centered on zero. Um, and uh, that can enable the uh, essentially better mixing in the in the chain of values um, because it's unlikely it becomes less likely that the values of theta or 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 mu or tau gets stuck in a um, an unfavorable location. So, for example, um, if it's the case that these random effects are supposed to be centered on, uh, let's say, a, a mean of zero, right? So these thetas are supposed to be centered on a mean of zero. The Gibbs sampler might get into a location where all the thetas are bigger than zero, right? And they're just sort of stuck there because they're locked in some correlation with a bunch of other parameters in the model and they have a hard time moving out of it. Sort of like this, right? You get stuck in one location, you have a hard time moving to another part in the space. Uh, well, what happens is this sort of restores, even in that unfavorable kind of equilibrium, it, it's, it restores the random effects to be what they're supposed to be. Uh, and and it, then it rescales also the mean effect to be what it's supposed to be. Um, so this is, is essentially just a way of um, uh, allowing the parameters to float around in the space more freely, even when there are some cases where coefficients can get sort of locked into an unfavorable location. So these are two ideas, and we'll check these both out in um, 
in um, R and in uh, JAGS in a moment. Uh, there's one other thing to think about, specifically having to do with a hierarchical model. Uh, it can be the case that centering coefficients in a hierarchical model, so-called hierarchical centering, uh, can help speed the convergence of the model. So here's a little simple model where I've got y hat as a function of an intercept, a random effect, a to i, and a slope beta 1 times a value x. And I can rewrite that instead of the way it is, is I can rewrite it as beta 0 plus eta plus beta 1 times x minus x bar. And all I've done, it's beta 1 will be the same in both cases. The beta 0 will change, but it's, inter it's just its interpretation. It's a benign rescaling. All I've done is just subtracted the mean of x from x. And the key uh, um, beneficial effect that that has is it breaks up the correlation between draws of beta 0 and draws of beta 1. So if uh, I'm dealing with data that sort of are out here, uh, it can be the case that the, the um, slope and the intercept are very uh, correlated because small changes in these things cause big changes in the necessary slope that has to fit the data, right? So if I were to get a different draw of this intercept, that's going to really change the slope I need to fit that little cloud of group level data that I've got. Um, so the intercept and the slope are going to be very closely linked in this, in this little sort of toy model where I've got one, two, three groups, random intercepts and random slopes. The random slope on group one is going to be a strong function of the random intercept on group one. But if I rescale the data, so now the data all look like this. Now, if I change the intercept, the slope doesn't change much at all, right? So here's like the sort of best fitting model. If I were to change the intercept a little bit and move it up here, uh, the best fitting slope would change maybe a bit, maybe, maybe a little bit. But for the most part, it's going to tend to stay the same. Uh, in fact, it, you know, now that I think about it, it might actually be the exact same slope. It might be actually the exact same slope as the best fit. I'd have to formally work that out, but that may be true. So it's breaking the correlation between those two parameters in a way that helps the, uh, helps the Gibbs sampler move through that space. So that's one helpful thing you can do. Another helpful thing you can do is rewrite um, an intercept uh, plus a, a mean zero um, random effect plus another mean zero random effect, right? So this might be like a, a group random effect and then a time random effect, something like that. You can move that intercept into the mean of one of the random effects. And what that does is it breaks up correlation among these three things, right? So these two things can trade off one against one another. These th they trade off also against the intercept. Moving that intercept into one of the random effects can help, essentially for the same reason I explained over here, can help sort of improve the mixing of the Markov chains and allow greater exploration of the space. All right, so um, let's take a look at uh, some of these ideas. We're actually going to go through both of these ideas and then this centering idea in uh, some examples in R. And the, for the first example, we're going to return to the radon data set and try rewriting the model using the uh, Wiecki uh, rewriting procedure and then separately using the Gelman and Hill slash Gelman et al. Uh, rewriting procedure. So uh, what I need to do is to slightly rewrite the model in a way that's going to allow me full exploration of the beta space. And uh, one way uh, it's proposed to do this, this is the way that's proposed in the Gelman and Hill book and also in the Gelman and All BDA3 book, is to introduce uh, what are called sort of uh, adjoint or adjusted parameters. These are adjusted parameters for A and for B. And here's adjusted parameters for eta and for, now I'm calling these B etas. I think I was just calling them Bs before. Now I've pulled out a slope, a common grand slope across all the counties, and now this is just a pure random effect, so it's centered on zero, should be. And what I've done is I've created adjusted parameters such that now A adjusted is A plus the mean of the random effects. B adjusted, so the slope is just B plus the mean of the slope random effects. And then down here when I get to eta, the adjusted eta values are eta minus the mean of the current estimates of eta. 
and B eta, the beta eta, <laughs> beta eta, are the uh, values, the current values of beta eta in the chain minus the current mean values of the beta eta in the chain. What's going on here? Well, what's going on here is I'm essentially forcing eta and beta, beta eta, to have a mean of zero, which it, they should because they're random effects. And that means they're centered on zero and have some variation. I'm also forcing the slopes to incorporate any possible non-zero mean of the current estimates of the random effects. Now, you might say this is weird. Why am I doing this? If I go back to my original model, like for example, for eta, you can see eta is centered on zero. Eta is supposed to be centered on zero. That's the prior density that we put on it. So why is it that I have to force it to be zero? Well, even though eta is centered on zero, uh, in the model, sometimes the Gibbs sampler can get stuck in, in, un, in unfavorable regions where the eta's in any particular draw of the chain are not centered around zero uh, and where the slope random effects are not centered on their proper mean. And so this adjustment essentially forces those things to take on whatever distribution they're supposed to have, in this case a random effect distribution centered on zero, a normal distribution centered on zero, and it, it means that uh, it, it, it tends to break up uh, the relationship between estimates, for example, of uh, beta and estimates of tau beta. It tends to make those things move a little more independently. So the adjusted value of any particular beta will no longer uh, necessarily be strongly linked to uh, the particular value of uh, tau that we are caught in. So it's basically designed to break up correlations that are in the matrix and allow the Gibbs sampler to more fully explore the space. So this is, a, this is the solution proposed by Gelman and Hill in, in chapter 19, I think. And the uh, question is, does it, does it do anything? Does it actually fix anything? Well, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to estimate this model, and while it's running, I'll tell you what I'm doing here. You'll notice I'm now, uh, when I'm estimating this model, I'm no longer monitoring A. I'm monitoring the adjusted value of A. I'm monitoring the adjusted value of B. Uh, and I'm monitoring the adjusted value of beta eta for 75. And the reason for that is because these adjusted values are sort of forced to, to behave more like the model expects them to, we might expect their estimates to move around the space more freely. So in, in uh, I have to say, in this case, um, these now the sort of the model parameters are not uh, necessarily as strongly identified as they were before because this adjusted value, I could, this adjusted value is, um, I could get the same value of the eta adjusted with multiple definitions of eta and mean eta. In other words, I could move all the etas around and still get the same adjusted value. Uh, so technically, these these parameters are are not all jointly identified. Um, what I'm doing is I'm monitoring the adjusted parameters in hopes that, based on the assumptions, based on essentially the assumption that my, the true eta adjusted should be centered on zero, I'm more strongly identifying these parameters relative to the original model that just had eta and beta floating around. So I, I have introduced into this model parameters that are really not identified. And in fact, if you track, let's say, b, or or actually I think b dot eta, um, you'll find it floats around the space. In fact, maybe I should just do that. If I let's see if I can add B eta seventy five. So I'm now I'm going to track the seventy fifth value of of that parameter along with the adjusted version of the seventy fifth parameter. And what I suspect is going to happen is B eta seventy five is going to drift around the space a little more freely uh, than but beta eta adjusted will be centered on, it'll sort of behave normally. It'll, it'll behave like an identified parameter. 
So we have to wait for a second for, for that to go through. Mm, I'll pause the video while that cranks through its chain. All right, so uh, the chain is converged. I have, or I've finished sampling rather. I am, I am examining the MCMC plot from this new chain. And what do we see? Still looks fine, but sigma beta now, you may notice, looks a lot different than it did before. It's now sampling far more draws from sigma near zero than it was before. That's substantially different than the previous plot that we were looking at for sigma beta. Uh, here's the beta eta adjusted parameter. It's, you know, about up there. Uh, interestingly, not a lot of actually unidentification or de-identified sort of wandering behavior in this case. So it may be the case that actually this is not too bad in terms of the identification. In other words, the etas and, and betas were not wandering around too badly. Uh, at least the 75th one wasn't. Uh, if I look at the Gelman diagnostic, actually it may, <laughs> in some ways, may look a bit worse <laughs> because the you can see here tau beta has a r hat of about 1.05. Uh, but if I look at, here's I'm just converting this all to a chain. Here is a plot of, actually I think it would be better to look at this plot. Here's a plot of the samples of tau beta relative to beta eta adjusted 75. And you can see right away, we're getting way more samples from uh, deep in deep within the, what you might call the distribution of, um, the distribution of tau. So it essentially the Gibbs sampler is moving much more effectively into that, uh, that tunnel. And Let's see, if I look at this, you know, like I said, it pretty much looks the same. It looks like there's not a big difference between the adjusted and the, and the normal parameter, and this, for at least for the 75th parameter. But one thing I want you to take a look at is here's this is the original histogram we drew for sigma beta before uh, from the first model. Here's the here's the new one, and in fact we probably should adjust uh, slightly this plot so you can see the full density. Eh, go a little further. There we go. So our original samples from the posterior look like this. The modified sample, the, the 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 modified model, which is equivalent to the pre-existing model, our distribution for sigma beta looks far far different, and in fact, all the density now is primarily concentrated around um, almost zero. In other words, concentrated around there being very little uh, slope variation between counties. So, substantively, a rather different answer, even though the models are equivalent. All right, so, well, what do we make of this? Well, before we get into that, let's take a look at one other alternative uh, specification. Again, same model, but it's just a slight rewriting of the model. This is the version that's offered by Wiecki. And uh, again, I've got a random effects distribution. In this case, I've taken out the common group mean. I'm just concentrating that around mu eta. Here's the slopes. I'm concentrating that around mu b. Again, I could rewrite this maybe a little bit to make it a little more readable. Oops. So what I've done is instead of having uh, eta drawn from a normal distribution with a mean and a variance, I've created, or a precision, I've created this offset variable. And then eta is a combination of mu dot eta, which is the mean value of eta, as you might expect, and then the offset times sigma eta. Now that's equivalent, essentially, to writing uh, eta is a function of, uh, or is distributed normally with some mean and some standard deviation. But the trick is here, this allows samples of mu eta and samples of sigma eta to be drawn independently, statistically independently, and that is happening because this offset value sort of allows there to be quick random rescalings of sigma eta throughout a bunch of the space. 
So it's it, again, this technique is just a way of trying to break up the correlation between individual beta values. So we can here see here's beta as a function of mu beta and sigma beta. Now the relationship between the mu beta and the sigma beta won't be quite as strong, and so hopefully the sampler will get to move into that funnel uh, a little more and sample more fully through the space. So I'm going to take this model now, and uh, it does require me to initialize these offset values, right? So I have to specify, I don't have to, but I, I am in this case specifying initial values for the offsets. And now I'm going to draw some samples out of this new model. Again, I'm drawing 20,000 iterations. You notice, you may have noticed I did uh, increase the burn in just a little bit. It won't be that different from my initial burn in, which was 1,000, but I thought it would give a little more time to settle into whatever limiting distribution it was. So uh, this will take a second to run, so I'll pause the video, let this sampler run, and then we'll look at the results. All right, the chain is finished. So uh, let's take a look at, I'm actually going to uncomment this. Uh, oh, I need to change this to three. Let's take a look at the MCMC plot here. I guess I should change that one to three too, huh? There we go. And let's pull up the MCMC plot. Here it is. Again, looks pretty fine. Sigma beta distribution looks rather different than it did before. Interestingly, the blue chain seems to have <laughs> gotten stuck at zero for a little bit. A little bit of a hiccup there at some point in the chain. Uh, everything else looks pretty normal. Um, look at the Gelman diagnostic for this. Does it get much better than that? Uh, the upper CI for sigma betas R hat value is slightly elevated, but maybe not enough to be a significant problem. And uh, now we will start, we will conclude, and actually I'm going to, let's see, ylim equals c, zero, I think we did, did we do seven before? Uh, okay, there's the original model we ran. There's the model with the Gelman and Hill suggested changes. There's the model with the Wiecki suggested changes. And uh, two out of three are showing a very, very different um, relationship here in the, basically the extent to which the slopes are random than the original model. So based on this little demonstration, I would conclude probably not a great idea to, to use the first model. Uh, it's better to use one of these reparameterized re models. Now, uh, this is <laughs> a little scary because it suggests that you can run a, a model uh, you can get through the whole thing. You can do your homework, check your diagnostics. Everything kind of looks right. You can look at the chains. Nothing looks particularly crazy. And it can still be wrong. And that is true. Uh, this has uh, spurred, as I understand it, some significant research into Monte Carlo uh, sampling algorithms that are less susceptible to this problem by default. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo being the one I know, I don't know much about it, but I know the most about that one. It's, uh, it, it's the algorithm that underlies STAN, which is a, a new Gibbs, well, it's not a Gibbs sampler, a new sampling algorithm, sampling program that's uh, being spearheaded by Andrew Gelman and a big team of researchers. And maybe those things will allow a little more automation, although my personal experience is there's plenty of troubleshooting and thinking to do even when you're using that procedure. Uh, not that my experience is particularly deep in that area, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily uh, as plug-and-play as running a linear regression in Stata or something. Um, I think the, the onus is to, uh, when you're running a model, to think about how the model is structured and try to adjust the model in such a way that its convergence is uh, more likely to be good, um, to try to structure the, the bug file in such a way that the parameters aren't going to be as closely correlated with each other, you don't get this, these funnels that, that cause sampling issues, and to maybe try multiple versions of a model to see, to make sure that they're giving you similar answers, and if they're not, to figure out why, and then use the one that's uh, that seems to be giving uh, more accurate estimates, or a, a more, more, I guess, a samples that more fully explore the space of, of the parameters of, that you're interested in. 
Uh, there are also there's also another trick that you can uh, use. It's it's a little more relevant to hierarchical models. It's a hierarchical centering. Uh, let, let's uh, I'm going to use a different data set to demonstrate that. So let me open up this new data set and I'll show you uh, something you can do pretty much by default that will help these models uh, tend to uh, converge better. All right, so uh, now I've got a, a new example. I'm going to clear out my my data space here. And uh, these are just loading up the standard libraries, most of which are already kind of loaded. Maybe a few of them weren't already in my space. And I'm going to focus, oh, I need to set my working directory to the source file so I get the data and scripts and stuff I want. And um, I'm going to look at uh, some data from, this is an extract from the American National Election Study. And if I look at a head of this data, whoop, probably should center my fingers on the home keys. Oh, that's not what I wanted. That's what I wanted. So uh, what I have here is uh, every observation is an individual sample of the NES, and, I've, and the NES has asked them a bunch of questions about their age, gender, their race, their frequency of church attendance, and this is the key dependent variable, uh, a feeling thermometer on, uh, on gays and lesbians. Um, and so what I'm trying to do uh, in this little example is to model um, people's uh, warm feelings <laughs> toward toward gay and lesbian people as a function of their party ID, their church attendance, race, gender, and age, and, and maybe some other stuff. We'll get to some other stuff later. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do, this is just a little bit of cleanup. Uh, I'm going to change my church and party ID variables to numeric. I'm going to drop any missing values. Uh, I'm going to only limit myself to uh, more recent data. This is 10 years old now almost, but it's more recent than 1948 at least. Uh, and then if I now do a head on that data, you can see I've got observations from 2008, and now there are far fewer uh, missing values. In fact, there are none because I omitted them, so all the missing values have been dropped. And uh, I don't usually like to attach data to the data space anymore, but well, we'll do it in this case just so I don't have to recode everything. So I've got 1,970 observations from the year 2008. So n should be 1,970, it is. Uh, I'm going to create my state indicators. Uh, so this is just every person, what state they're in. Uh, and the states are listed, chrono or not chronologically, but uh, in, in the order, I think, in which they appear in the data set. doesn't really matter. Uh, we can always link back the state names to the state indexes. Uh, well, in fact, we're going to do that right here. So whoops. There are the state names. So number one should be Arizona. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, okay, so oh, finally I'm going to create, this just averages, creates an average value of church attendance in every state, which I can use as a group level predictor for uh, gay feeling, or gay, <laughs> feeling thermometers toward gay people. Um, in my in my uh, model, so I can get a group level predictor to go along with my individual respondent level predictors. So here's my model. Uh, my model says that uh, the gay feeling thermometer is normally distributed. Uh, the gay feeling thermometer is bounded between zero and 100. For this example, I'm neglecting that. If I was going to, you know, publish this or do this more seriously, I probably would want to think about the truncation there and maybe create a truncated normal or do something different, but for this little example, it's probably okay to just assume that away. And uh, what am I going to do here? I'm going to say that uh, the mean of gay th feeling thermometer is first a random intercept on state, and then a linear function of age, individual church attendance, and then here's a random slope on state by party ID, the idea being that some states party is strongly linked to gay feeling thermometer ratings, and in South states it's not. Uh, and so this is just a distribution of the state and individual level intercept, I'm sorry, the, let me be clear here, the individual, the random intercepts and random slopes which vary by state, in this case I've specified them as a multivariate normal, so as to allow the intercepts and the uh, coefficients, the slope coefficients to be correlated, if they are. Uh, to, and to estimate that correlation. So you may notice I have a group level predictor here. Uh, that's right here. 
it's inside of the uh, mu state i dash or i comma one, which means it's part of the right here, the random intercept distribution. And what I'm allowing is that intercept, that random state level intercept to be a function of average church attendance. This is the kind of thing you might do if you were worried uh, that in a random effects model like this one, if you were worried that the random effect might be correlated with church attendance. You might say some states, just pulling out a couple here, Alabama, <laughs> Mississippi, uh, maybe Texas, maybe Georgia, would have uh, on average higher church attendance than other states, California, Washington, um, I don't know, New York. Um, and that that difference is also correlated with their, uh, with their intercept, with their random intercept. In this case, the degree to which uh, the average approval of or average feeling thermometer for gay people is higher or lower in that state. In this case, that seems plausible. Uh, it seems like it's plausible that those two things are correlated. And if they were, that would invalidate the use of a random effects model like this one. You'd need a fixed effects model. So applying the, um, well, Munlach said it first in the 70s, and then Gelman and Bafumi said it again uh, more recently, you can put in uh, average church attendance as a predictor to hopefully break that, that correlation and restore the validity of the estimates from a random effect model. So I'm doing that uh, in this case. Uh, here's my hyper distribution for the uh, coefficients here, the random intercepts and random slopes. There's my hyper distribution for the church, uh, average church attendance variable. I've got a Wishart prior um, uh, on the random intercept and slope tau distributions, and then some basically some relatively diffuse normal distributions on all the other. Um, all the other, uh, oh, I have a party in here again. I don't need that, so I'll just get rid of that. That's already been handled, so that's from, that must be from an earlier version of this model. So I've got just normal, sort of normally distributed, relatively diffuse priors on age uh, and on uh, church attendance. And then finally, a, a diffuse hyper prior on the uh, degree to it, or the, I'm sorry, diffuse prior rather on the precision of the of the overall model on the basically the noise present in the data so again relatively ordinary looking hierarchical linear model nothing particularly crazy about it nothing particularly different um, however we're going to run into some convergence issues so if I uh, wait a minute oh yeah I don't need to specify a this parameter is extra, so I don't need to put a prior in there, for, or I don't need to put an initial value for that, rather. Okay, so you may notice I'm uh, drawing from uh, 10 chains, a uh, burn-in of 2,000, and then 2,000 samples from each chain. Uh, it won't take long to sample here, and then we can look at an MCMC -MC plot. I actually think it might be uh, first illuminative to look at the R hat Gelman diagnostic. Uh, yeah, I don't need to track B party. Yeah, well, that's fine. That error is uh, not important. It won't affect any of our results. Uh, let's look at the Gelman diagnostic. Pretty good. Not Nothing in there that would immediately make me think that convergence was a problem. Uh, but if I look at the MCMC plot uh, traces of the chains uh, for all my parameters in this model, Visually, I'm going to be able to uh, detect with the interocular test that uh, these chains are, are not mixing well. So and there's a lot of parameters, so it's going to take a while for MCMC plot to make all the plots. Mm. There we go, and we're done. So here's what the plots look like. Uh, let's take a look at this. Look at this. Whoa. Jeez. Let me shrink this down a bit. There we go. Um, so look at this plot for age. Look at the running means here, look at how the chains are behaving, and then look at the final distributions. Uh, the distributions aren't exactly on top of each other, right? They, they look like there's quite a bit of chain-to-chain -chain variation, uh, so-called between variation, in the in how the chains are sampling. Same for church. There's, this beta on church individual level church attendance seems like it's not really mixing as well as it could. Uh, tau y looks better, 
And now we start to get into the individual random effects, and they just look insane. I mean, this that is not a clean looking, you know, all the distributions for each chain are not the same. And the fact that I did 10 chains allow you to re allows you to really see, you know, this is not really performing at the level we would want. A lot of these chains are just sort of not the same as one another, even though the diagnostic says they're they're good. I, I don't, I just don't believe it looking at these, at these uh, behaviors. So of course the question becomes, uh, what can I do about that? Uh, well, what I can do about it, uh, actually, just one more thing. Uh, if you do, um, actually, I don't need this and I don't need this. So if I use uh, M, uh, from the MCMC plots library, Caterplots to depict, here we go. These are the random intercepts from state to state. Those are the random slopes from state to state. And you can see uh, Wisconsin <laughs> seems to be behaving uh, a little poorly. Something is going wrong there. Um, wait a minute. Yeah, there we go, because I, I took out the this meaningless B party uh, uh, variable before my my indexes were a little off on constructing this caterplot, so I just had to readjust these to go down by one. So instead of 38 to 71, I had to go 37 to 70. Whatever. Anyway, so not 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 as bad as it initially looked. Um, anyway, so here's the distribution of these are the, this is the distribution of uh, random intercepts with uncertainty uh, in my in the chains, and you can see the uh, the coldest feeling states toward. Uh, gays are Mississippi, Louisiana, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, Alabama. Not not a big surprise there. The warmest feeling states: Massachusetts, California, New Jersey, Arizona, Colorado. Again, nothing crazy there. Uh, those random intercepts sort of pass the the prima facie test of making sense. And then here's the random slopes. And what you can see is party ID has the smallest effect in Connecticut, Ohio, South Carolina. The largest effect in Delaware. Uh, I'm sorry. Scratch that and reverse it. Party ID has the strongest negative effect on, uh, meaning the strongest, biggest slope, but it's a negative slope, in uh, Connecticut, Ohio, and South Carolina, and Colorado, and a slightly smaller slope in Delaware, uh, Michigan, Oklahoma, New York. So nothing seems to be going on there much with the slopes. These things aren't don't look different from one another very much. Uh, but because the chains aren't working, don't appear to be converging correctly, all, all this is cast into doubt. So uh, what I'm going to do to make my model behave a little better is, whoops, I'm going to um, in, 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 uh, modify my data to be centered uh, by state on its mean. So in terms of a regression model, uh, this is a relatively benign adjustment. Um, if I run the model, you know, beta 0 plus beta 1 times x, uh, that's the same model as beta 0 plus beta 1 times quantity x minus x bar, where x bar is the mean. Um, the intercept, the meaning of the uh, y-intercept, beta zero, changes a bit, um, but the model is equivalent and equally valid. And what this has the effect of doing, is, as I'm sort of demeaning all of these variables by state, it has the effect of breaking up the correlation between the random intercepts and all the slopes, including the random slopes that are being estimated, because the now all the intercepts are going to be sort of shifted, um, so that the intercept now means essentially what the, whatever the the feeling thermometer should be when um, when all these sort of mean centered variables are equal zero in the state, uh, and it, it basically just allows the correlation between the slope estimates and the and the and the intercept estimates to be less related, so the sampler has an easier time. Uh, moving through the parameter space. And that's the only change I'm going to make. I'm going to use, you can see I'm using the exactly the same bug file. Uh, I am going to take out B party again because that variable is not necessary. Uh, and I think I should be ready to go. So if I just run this, and now while I'm waiting, since I took out that B party, I got to readjust these indices, so I'm actually picking up the right effects. Uh, and that's got to be a 2, and then that's got to be a 30. Uh, is that right? Did I already adjust these? Uh, 3 to 36, and then 
37 to 70. 70. And then this should be 2 plus 0 and 36 plus 0. Or O, oh, not 0. Okay. So, oh, I'm done. Good. So, looking at the Gelman diagnostics, looks pretty good. Looks even a little better than last time. Uh, if I run the MCMC plot, uh, trace plots, give a second for that to compile. And pull this up right here. They look better. Um, the, the distributions are much more on top of one another than they were before. Uh, this is still a bit rough, but these states, these state parameters look much more cleanly estimated than they were. Um, I wouldn't call them the cleanest I've ever seen, but they certainly look like they're behaving a little better and that we're sampling, all the chains are sampling out of the same distribution. That's, that's what we're looking for. That's certainly better. Now, okay, so now let me... Uh, did I change the name? No, it's a different, it's the same name. So I'm going to re-estimate my catter plots. So again, these are the intercepts, and if you compare this to the intercept plot we did before, here's the intercept plot we did before, Mississippi, Ella, uh, Louisiana, Oklahoma at the bottom, sort of hovering down here, Massachusetts, California, New Jersey at the top. Let me go back to this one. This is our new one. Uh, they changed a little. In fact, there seems to be a little more variation than there was before. Uh, some sort of a stronger separation between Mississippi, South Carolina, and Louisiana, and Massachusetts, California, and Arizona up here. So actually, the the random intercepts seem to be behaving a little more, sort of splitting the states a little more. Uh, and then if we look at uh, the slopes, I would say if anything, there's less variation than before. This is just this is basically telling me. There's really no, maybe maybe in California there's a slight effect, but uh, the effect of party ID on um, on uh, attitudes toward uh, gay people is virtually nil, which is quite fascinating, at least to me as a social scientist, because I think that would, I, I speculate that would not have been the case in, let's say, 1996 or, or 2000. Um, in 2008, by 2008, it seems like, pretty much the effect of partisanship has, has gone, at least net of these other factors, has, has gone to nil, which is pretty interesting. So in terms of the, the point of this lesson, I think the, the point you can draw from this is that you can get uh, slightly different answers, in some cases substantially different answers, uh, with relatively small modifications of how you've written the model or how you've specified the data. And I think based on the readings and based on our little example here, some uh, ways of writing a model and some ways of, of specifying the data in a hierarchical model are better than others on average and typically. So uh, it's a good idea in hierarchical models to center the data, uh, center the data around the group means. Uh, and it's uh, a good idea in... Um, uh, in any Bayesian model when you're Gibbs sampling to write the model in such a way that the parameters will be uh, less correlated with one another, either using these adjustment parameters, sort of adjusting the means to be separately estimated, uh, or um, uh, using these offset parameters that break up the relationship between the mean and the, and the precision of a particular, a particular parameter. All right, so... Um, that's all I have to say about um, uh, convergence, um, convergence assessment. Uh, so now let's transition into talking about um, uh, model fit uh, more generally, assuming that your, uh, your sampler is working correctly. And we'll talk about a couple of different topics, uh, including uh, assessing model fit with posterior predicted densities, and, and then assessing uh, doing some uh, model comparison tests. Okay, so assuming you don't have any um, convergence issues in your sampler, uh, in other words, you know, the model is sampling properly. How do you determine uh, whether it's the right model, whether it's a good f fit uh, to the data? Uh, well, one way uh, that's recommended by uh, Gelman and Hill and Gelman et al. is to uh, check that the simulated data generated from the model is consistent with actual data from the data set. 
And the idea is to simulate data from f of y given theta using the samples of theta that you drew, and then compare this to various aspects of the empirical distribution of y that's in the data set. It's conceptually pretty similar uh, to what you might do in a linear regression comparing uh, y hat to observed y, or maybe comparing uh, u hat to y, uh, to ensure that um, you know, there aren't any systematic uh, fit problems where the errors have some sort of shape that doesn't look like noise, right? You don't want you don't want non-noise error um, in a noise term. So uh, let's take a look. This is actually quite easy to do uh, in um, uh, using uh, sampling because we're already going to be drawing tons of samples, so we might as well uh, draw predictions. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is continue with the uh, gay attitudes example that we were looking at before. And if I open this up in R, uh, so this is essentially the same model I was running before. Uh, I'll open up this uh, bug file. Uh, it's a little different in the sense that I believe I've, uh, actually, no, it's exactly the same. I'm running exactly the same model that I did before. The only thing I have changed uh, is I am added this little line right here. And what is it doing? It's generated. It's generating uh, out of the normal distribution centered on mu y and tau y. So the same distribution here for which I'm assuming my data is distributed. It's generating draws uh, of the dependent variable, the gay thermometer variable, from that model, and it's drawing. Uh, a, 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 it's drawing an, a, a sample from the um, predicted distribution. Um, for every single uh, iteration of the Gibbs sampler that that that, um, that I'm going through, and so what that means is, uh, for every time my simulation updates the various values of B age and B state and B church and all this stuff, it's also going to update its uh, a draw from the posterior predictive density of y given the data because the posterior predictive density of y given the data is just this likelihood function, which is a function of mu y, function of all the betas and the and the and um, yeah, the betas, and tau y, which is the standard error of the regression. In this case, the precision of the regression. So, I've really changed hardly nothing, uh, hardly anything at all. I'm going to rerun um, my full suite of code here, um, just to get a completely clean uh, view on this. Uh, oh, I have to change the working directory. Oh, wait a minute. I probably... Yep, I attached that more than once. You gotta be careful. This is why I don't like using the attach function. Uh, okay, so now I'm uh, updating some samples. And let's talk about what I'm gonna do once I'm done. So you'll notice I'm only tracking one parameter in this run of the model. And that parameter is gaytherm.ppd. It is a posterior predictive density draw for every single um, uh, value of y, the gay therm, in the data set. And it's just going to save. I'm, I'm drawing 2,000 iterations from the, from, the, um, from the posterior predictive density here. And uh, this is going to enable me to... Uh, am I done? Yeah, I'm done. It's going to enable me to look at what, the, what that posterior predictive density of the data looks like. So uh, let's just go right here, um, and I may have to shrink this down to make it look a little more proportionate. This is uh, a kernel density estimate of the actual y of data uh, of the of the dependent variable, and what you can see is uh, there's variation between zero and 100. 0 and 100 are the are the uh, theoretical minimum and ma or the empirical minimum and maximum. Uh, th they're boundaries of the measurement scale here. Uh, I could, if I wanted to, uh, improve this a little bit by saying, so then I don't, I don't actually break those boundaries, and I guess that's a nice thing to do. Um, I'm gonna add these to all these, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what is the Gibbs sampler actually um, predicting um, for a for a bunch of different values of the of of uh, a bunch of different positions in the chain. My chain is of length two thousand. So, for example, here's the data set, the predictive data set that I drew uh, for iteration one thousand. Right. This is the this was the thousandth iteration of the uh, of the chain, 
And that's what that's the distribution of uh, Gaytherm that I predicted for that data set. Uh, does it match? Kind of. <laughs> it's certainly capturing the contours of the distribution, but you'll notice it's also smoothing out the lumps quite a lot. Uh, and then if we repeat this for, here's the 1200th distribution, here's the 1400th distribution, here's the 1800th distribution. Uh, it seems like this model might be uh, basically capturing what's going on, um, but there's some issues here. Um, I see that, for example, there's a big spike at 50, and there's nothing about the model that's doing a good job, apparently, of capturing that spike at 50. So, you know, not a, not crazy. In other words, the, the, the posterior predicted density kind of looks like the model, uh, but it seems like it is not capturing one particularly important feature of the data set. Uh, another thing we could do, um, oh, so here we go. So what I'm going to do here is calculate the average prediction, posterior prediction of Gaytherm. So I'm just going to basically move through all the entire um, Markov chain matrix, calculating means for each observation of Gaytherm, basically each person in the data set. And then I'm going to plot those average predictions against um, the data set. And if I add in a little uh, regression line here, you can see that um, they are related. Um, the average prediction of Gaytherm is related to the observed value of Gaytherm, which is essentially what you would expect. Uh, but the, it's 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 uh, not certainly not a perfect prediction, right? So uh, you, what you can see here is um, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, it, this is a noisy prediction at best. Uh, and in fact, if we look at what's the relationship between the prediction and um, and the actual value, uh, the slope is one, which is essentially what you would expect for a regression type model. It's highly statistically significant, also what you would expect. Uh, m much of the variance is unexplained. Um, so my overall assessment of this model is, you know, not crazy, um, but perhaps not capturing certain features of the data uh, that are kind of important. Uh, one thing we could also look at is we could um, look at, for example, um, relationships between uh, the error terms um, and the uh, observed values of y. So uh, if I go in here and I say, okay, I want to calculate an, an error term now. So I would say something like the average error term is going to be And of course, I could I could actually predict this for every single uh, every single iteration, but I'm just sort of averaging the iterations and calculating the average error. Uh, and then I could do a plot of right. So there's a plot of the error against the observed value, and I could also do a plot of the error against the predicted value, y hat. Uh, oh, that's not in debt. Uh, sorry. There we go. Right. So um, for the value of, for plotting the value of the error against the observed value of y, um, you might think, OK, well, this is kind of concerning <laughs> because the smaller values tend to have uh, larger errors. Uh, but um, you have to remember that the way the regression works, um, correlation is only is only supposed to be zero by, by basically by guarantee between y hat and u hat, not between necessarily between y and u. And in fact, bigger or smaller values of y are Sort of naturally going to lead to bigger or smaller values of u, uh, if the um, if there's any sort of noise in the regression process or in the linear data generating process at all. So really, the more relevant plot to look at is, is this one. And um, what do we see? Well, we are in fact seeing a pattern in the relationship between um, the predicted values and u. It looks like, for example, as this prediction value goes up, uh, u goes down. Uh, well, what could cause that? Well, uh, one thing that could cause that is uh, potentially 
uh, the fact that, uh, first of all, it looks like the average, uh, it looks like they're sort of lines here. This is not a cloud. And what I think that means is that the Gaytherm uh, variable uh, is not sort of, it's, it's quasi-continuous, but it's not truly continuous in the space. Um, so going back to this plot of U against Gaytherm, you'll notice um, there are sort of commonly recurring values in Gaytherm, and uh, those commonly recurring values are being, they're not being sort of, they're being predicted as continuous values by the model. So the value, the model, when it predicts a gay theorem of like, say, somewhere in this range between 70 and 30 or 20, all the, all these observations, you know, sort of are, are caught on one particular value of gay theorem of 45. And in fact, that prediction is pretty close to, to, to what it ought to be. Um, but it, there's sort of systematic variation. Um, and owing to the fact that the model is predicting a continuous variable and the observed variable is actually quasi-discrete. So that's one issue I see here. Another issue I see here is even if these steps weren't here, even if there was just a cloud, you would see this sort of a downward correlation. And I think that's because um, uh, of the boundaries in, uh, in the actual um, Gaytherm uh, variable. So if I go back and I plot... Gaytherm against uh, predicted Gaytherm. Actually, maybe I'll do it the other way. There we go. Uh, what I can see here is um, we are uh, reaching uh, boundaries on on the Y space, right? So Y runs into hundred and it runs into zero and again you can see the discrete nature of the of the of the y here which is causing us some issues in the prediction um, and so what that means is the so reversing this plot so thinking about this as error term the errors uh, hit a ceiling right so uh, if we if we put in the uh, put in the line you can see, uh, errors below the line can get pretty big. Errors above the line can only get so big once we are reaching higher values of, of the prediction. And then conversely, down here, when the prediction value is, is 20, errors can be huge that are positive, but they can pretty only be pretty small when they're negative. And so when we go back and plot U against the, the average predictions, we see that coming in, right? So for the largest predictions, the errors tend to be uh, negative. And for the smallest predictions, the errors tend to be positive. So what I'm essentially getting out of this is a couple of things. First of all, Gaither may actually be a discrete variable. We might want to think about that, uh, even though it's nominally continuous. Uh, we may want to sort of model it as discrete because that seems to be possibly what's going on. Um, and then secondly, um, the boundaries may actually be somewhat relevant here. Um, they may be actually forming... Going back to this here, uh, they may be actually limiting our ability to accurately uh, predict um, the observed variable, uh, Gaytherm. And it may be better, for example, to instead of modeling this as a line, um, to maybe model it as a, uh, to model Gaytherm as a, 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 an S shaped function that reaches limits at 100 and 0. So, for example, if we're looking at the relationship between gay therm and, uh, let's see, what's one of my um, party ID? Mm -hmm. um, of course, these all appear as dots because these are two quasi-discrete variables. Do we have any truly linear? I think a age might be a bit better. Yeah, that's a bit better. So it may be the case um, that it would be better to modify to model this instead of as a linear function, where I'm going to hit these boundaries. And actually, I think this is almost certainly a negative line, right? It may be better to model this as a sigmoid function that sort of recognizes and accounts for the boundaries. That might result in a bigger fit. 
And I can, you know, get a sense of this from, from looking at the posterior predictive densities. It's just in the way I could get that by looking at re residuals in a regression. All right, so, you know, that's how I can assess how well my model is doing um, sort of relative to maybe an idealized model fit. Um, what about model comparison? Well, let's talk a little bit about model comparison. All right, so <clears throat> um, if I have more than uh, two models, uh, how do I know which model uh, is the best fit to my data, uh, whether that be in-sample fit or out-of-sample fit? Uh, in-sample fit is essentially asking uh, if I uh, used a bunch of points uh, to fit uh, a particular model to my data, uh, how well did I do in fitting those points? So it might involve some measure of the error in prediction for the in-sample points. And then out of simple uh, prediction says, if I had data that were not used in fitting the model, how well does it do in predicting those points, right? Um, the basis of a lot of fit statistics, uh, at least for, well, generally, but specifically also in Bayesian uh, models, is the deviance. Uh, I'm calling that delta here. I don't think that's normal nomenclature, but it was just convenient for my particular notes. Uh, and deviance is negative two times the, the log likelihood, where L, the log likelihood here, is the uh, posterior uh, probability of the data given theta hat, and theta hat is the expected value of, um, I guess I should, I should add in here, it looks like theta hat is the expected value of theta hat. Um, it's the expected value of theta hat i, there we go, where i indexes the simulations, uh, um, or the iterations of the Markov chain, draws from the Markov chain. So in other words, these, this is the, uh, in this case, theta hat is the Bayes estimate of the parameter or uh, the integral of f of theta given the data over ti uh, times theta d theta. So in other words, it's the expected value of theta given the posterior. And that's easy to compute in a Markov chain um, simulation framework. All you need to do is calculate the expected value of theta, right? The, the empirical, uh, take all the draws of theta you have and just get the average. Um, so uh, that's, our, that's our sort of core, the deviance is our core statistic. And there are various things that we can do with that in order to compute uh, model fit statistics that can be used for comparison. And probably the, uh, the, the easiest one to deal with when doing Bayesian modeling is the deviance information criterion. Uh, so the deviance information criterion is um, uh, two times the, uh, actually this needs to be positive, I think. Yeah. Um, two times the log likelihood, the negative log likelihood, plus two times uh, this pen penalty factor the penalty factor uh, is equal to um, the deviance minus uh, the expected, the expectation over theta of uh, f of y given theta, the expected, the, the, likely, the log likelihood of uh, the data given theta. So um, one thing you might ask is, well, how is, how are, you know, how is uh, this different from, how is this different from this? Well, this uses a single value of theta to compute the likelihood, right? And it uses the Bayes estimate of theta to compute the, the likelihood. This takes the expectation over all the draws of theta, right? So it's not just calculated at one value of theta, theta hat, the Bayes estimate. It's calculated for all the values in the chain. So you can see, in fact, what you would need to do to calculate this when you were sampling uh, using Markov Chain Monte Carlo or Gibbs Sampler or whatever, is uh, to simply calculate the likelihood at every draw and then average the likelihood over those over those draws, right? So that forms a, a penalty factor. Um, uh, this is computed easily 
in uh, Jags or Winbugs uh, or OpenBugs, uh, and a lower is better. So what this uh, PDIC works out to be is a penalty factor. Uh, the more complicated your model is, the more parameters it has in it, uh, the more it will be penalized um, by this factor. Um, and so uh, you, you will notice, or you may if you already know about these, lots of information criteria have similar penalty factors. So the Akai key information criterion is essentially the deviance plus 2k, where k is the length of the parameter vector. Uh, now, in most models, you would compute the, uh, the deviance not using the Bayes estimates, but using theta hat, the maximum likelihood estimates. Uh, because typically we would be calculating this for a regression, an ordinary least squares regression model, or maybe a maximum likelihood model. Uh, the Bayesian information criterion, which even though it's called Bayesian, doesn't actually enter into Bayesian analysis all that much. Uh, again, it's uh, delta plus k log n, where n is the sample size. So again, for the Bayesian information, I'm sorry, for the Ikaiki information criterion, we got this penalty factor of 2k, the number of parameters in the model. For the Bayesian information criterion, we have k log n, again, penalty factor given the complexity of the model. The deviance information criterion has this PDIC factor. Um, what all of these penalties do is basically get you out of the, the so-called, you know, sort of the R-squared R trap where you can throw a bunch of garbage into a model and make the R-squared a little bit higher. These penalty factors uh, adjust for the complexity of the model and prevent you from gaming the system by throwing in tons and tons of garbage variables. Um, and in some cases, they have uh, theoretical uh, interpretations as well. So uh, the Akaiki information criterion, for example, um, in some circumstances, uh, approximates the decision made by uh, leave one out cross-validation, which is something we're going to talk about in a second. Um, it's, it's a little hard to compute these two quantities, uh, not impossible in certain packages, but using JAGs or bugs, it's a little hard to compute these two, whereas the deviance information criterion is built in. So I'll, I'll show you an example of how to uh, compute the DIC for a couple of models and, and to use them as uh, model comparison statistics under the general idea that although the penalty factor is different, conceptually it, it, they share similar qualities with the Akai key information criteria and the Bayesian information criteria. Um, probably the most Bayesian uh, possible model comparison statistic is also uh, pretty hard to compute. Uh, and that statistic is um, uh, the Bayes factor, BF here. The Bayes factor is essentially um, the probability the posterior probability uh, that uh, one model is correct, essentially, um, relative to the posterior probability uh, that a, another model uh, is correct. And so uh, what you have here is um, the ratio of, this is on the top and bottom here, this is the likelihood of the data given theta one, the parameters for model one, and the posterior probability that model one is correct. And uh, this is the probability density, posterior probability density of theta one given M1. So we've essentially, we're, what we're integrating out here is, uh, hold on a second. Yeah, so it might be actually helpful to rewrite this a little differently to write this as, this is the uh, integral, um, well, this whole thing up here is the probability or the likelihood of the data given model one divided by the probability of the data given model two, right? So what's happened here is this is an, exp is an integral, uh, basically what you get from this integral. You're integrating out here both the effect of theta one and, well, yeah, that's what you're doing. You're integrating out the effect of theta one. So this uh, expression here is equivalent to this expression here, given that essentially we've taken this, the overall likelihood of the, of the data, and we've integrated out uncertainty around the parameters to end up with just the overall likelihood of the, of the data given model one. 
And then similarly in the denominator, this is the overall likelihood that they have a given model too. And if you were to multiply this, so for example, if you multiply this numerator by Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. What we want is, what we really want is the probability of model 1 given the data. By Bayes' rule, that's going to be proportional to the probability of y given model 1 times the probability of model 1, right? Uh, there's going to be a, a correction factor here for the overall probability of y. But then when we divide these two things by each other, that correction factor cancels out. So if we take this um, ratio, and we multiply by the prior odds of... Uh, believing that each model is true, so your prior belief that each model specification is correct, uh, you get uh, is that yeah, that is right. So um, the base factor is I think I misspoke earlier. It's not actually the ratio of probabilities of the models. It's ratio of the likelihoods of the data in these models. And then when you multiply by the prior odds, uh, of the two models, you get the ratio of the probability of the two models. So this base factor uh, gives us a lot of information about essentially po posterior to seeing the data, right? If we can use the base factor to calculate this right here, how much we, what, what our posterior belief in each model should be given having seen the data. So in, in that sense, it's very much what we would want to get out of a Bayesian analysis. Uh, but in order to uh, compute it, you have to compute these integrals. Uh, and these integrals are not always the uh, easiest things to calculate um, in an analysis. And so uh, consequently, it's uh, <laughs> the degree to which this is actually used uh, varies. Uh, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do. It's much easier, for example, to calculate the uh, deviance information criterion. Uh, it's also relatively easy to do uh, something a little different and to calculate, as I mentioned before, uh, the degree of um, a model's uh, ability to predict out of sample. So um, uh, as a guard against overfitting a model, right, so uh, thinking about how this might look. Let me scroll, uh, how do I scroll down here? There we go. So if I have, um, whoops, if I have data that look like this, Uh, a very uh, bad idea would be to fit a model that looks like this, but it would have amazing in-sample fit, right? And so a way to guard against that being a problem is to hold a test set of cases uh, from your data outside of the fitting process, and then to assess the degree to which your model can predict these out of sample cases, and so a, a better model of the of the of the black in sample data would probably do a better job. So looking at the errors here, whoops. Uh, how do I? Yeah. Um, oh, did I close one by accident? Okay, let's try this again. Okay, so uh, the, uh, a, a, a yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, here we go. So a better fitting model to the black data which looks like this, would probably do a better job of predicting these out-of-sample data points. So like here. These errors are generally smaller than the errors that we would get looking at the difference between the out-of-sample data points and this sort of very bad uh, overfitted model, right? You'd be looking at much bigger errors. 
So um, using a sort of designating part of your holding out part of your data as a test set, uh, and uh, and then using um, using your uh, um, your Bayesian model to predict um, observations outside the test set can be a very effective way of figuring out how well your model is doing at um, at fitting the data, uh, and, and in particular, not overfitting the data. It's a relatively easy thing to do um, in in Bayesian statistics or in JAGs or in bugs. Uh, and it's a way that we can use to compare uh, two models to each other. We can basically say which which one does a better job of predicting out of sample. Uh, and then finally, um, related to model comparison, uh, we could think about um, two or more models as competing against one another. Um, uh, sort of, I've got this set of variables and this other set of variables. Um, maybe what I should do is I should actually have the Gibbs sampler try to dynamically choose um, which variables or maybe which collection of variables uh, belongs in the model. And there are a couple of different ways of doing this. Uh, one way is uh, Gibbs or stochastic variable selection, which essentially um, puts a um, it puts a an indicator variable uh, for whether a, a, whether a, a, a variable should be, or whether a set of variables should be included um, in the data model or not, and then it samples that indicator variable to figure out whether something belongs in there. Uh, another related way of doing this is the so-called uh, Bayesian lasso, uh, which essentially puts a prior on a parameter, uh, a double exponential or um, uh, Laplace distribution. So I've got a... Wikipedia article pulled up here. It basically puts a prior on on each parameter that's concentrated around zero, and so it it tends to uh, uh, basically pull shrink um, in in the Bayesian sense estimates toward zero if they don't have a very big effect on um, on the posterior on the likelihood. Um, so those are two different ways that we could think about. Um, essentially getting the inside the Gibbs sampler itself, trying to make the sampler choose uh, which variables are most relevant um, to, uh, to include in a model or maybe which collections of variables are most relevant. And uh, I want to just pull up a little article I found here. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, cancel. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing there. Uh, this is uh, uh, an article from Bayesian, Bayesian Analysis in 2009 uh, by O'Hara and Salanpa. A review of Bayesian variable selection methods, and they go through a bunch of different uh, possible, uh, uh, a bunch of different possible methods of doing this. Uh, there are various strategies one can use, uh, and the, what they all have in common is they attempt to move the model comparison or variable selection process. Um, it's not a post modeling procedure; it's actually happening inside of the Gibbs sampler itself. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is uh, we're going to go to R. I'm going to use some some of the examples we've been talking about. I'm going to show you some examples of um, uh, model comparison using deviance, uh, and then model comparison using out of sample prediction, and then finally we'll do some um, stochastic variable selection procedures um, in in JAGs as well. So let's do that now. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is go back to the um, uh, the example of modeling. Uh, um, a gay thermometer, feeling thermometer attitudes. And I'm going to compare two models. Uh, you can see I've actually added two variables to our, or here, let's see, here we go. I've added two variables to our pre existing model that just had um, random intercepts, AH, charge attendance, and party ID. I've taken out the random slopes on party ID to simplify the model a little bit for this demonstration. And I've added in two new variables uh, whether a person is female and whether a person is black. Um, the race variable is coded white, black, or other, and so I've just collapsed that into black and everything else, which is possibly a questionable uh, coding as it lumps in two very different um, uh, categories as the base category. But again, just to keep things a little simple here, uh, I've taken out the, uh, the random uh, slopes and just focused on random intercepts. I've also taken out the group level predictor, again, just trying to make this example as simple as possible. Uh, these are all just hyperparameters, and here's the where the the sort of important thing is happening. Uh, down here, I've got another what appears to be another data model, and what it's doing is it's predicting uh, gay therm again using the 
uh, the fitted uh, values uh, from the data model. Uh, but instead of predicting it for the data that's actually in the in the um, uh, that's being used to fit the model, it's being uh, 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 predicted for these test observations, right? So I've got age dot test instead of age, church attendance dot test instead of church attendance, and uh, where this comes from is I'm going to literally in a second in R I'll show you go into the data, pull out some of the observations to be used as test observations. And then I'm going to predict the value of Gaetherm in those observations using the fitted model from the training data set, the data set that's used to fit the model. Uh, so I'm not going to tell the sampler what Gaetherm.test is. I'm going to hold that back, and I'm going to see if the model does a good job of sort of predicting that, that data, even though it doesn't have access to it. This other model, so you can compare them here and here, you can sort of see what disappears. The only thing that disappears is the black variable. So what I'm basically checking here is, uh, do I, comparing two models that are nested in one another, do I have evidence that I need uh, the race, the black race variable in order to do a good job predicting out of sample this, uh, this Gaetherm um, uh, dependent variable? So um, uh, I should note here, uh, this code, do I have the data attached? Yeah, okay, so I'm fine here. Uh, this example is actually based on code um, from a course that's being taught at NC State. Um, I think it was last taught in the spring of this year, if my recollection is correct. Um, yeah, here we go. So this code is, is modeled on the uh, applied Bayesian statistics code that's being used um, up at NC State. Um, and I think... Yeah, so the instructor, where's the instructor? Brian Reich. Uh, so that's where this example comes from, although I adapted it to my own uh, needs and my own data set here. And uh, where the only thing that's really different uh, uh, from before is um, you can see the female and black variables are now in the data set and they weren't before, so that's new. Uh, another thing that's new is I'm randomly sampling 100 observations from the data set and I'm putting them into a test data set. So what that's going to allow me to do is to predict um, predict the dependent variable for these observations even though the model has not had access to that data to be able to fit them. And you'll notice here when I feed the data to JAGS, uh, Gaytherm.test is not in this set. All the dependent, all the independent variables for the test uh, set are in here, but the dependent variable is not. So now I should be able to just run this whole thing And here we go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run separate uh, models, one for, um, one for the uh, uh, model that includes black, which is gay attitude CV, one for the model that doesn't include black, which is gay attitudes.cv2. So I'm going to run this one first. Oh. Yep, okay. Guess I always got to change my source file. Okay. So I'll let this run for a second. All right, <clears throat> uh, that's done. So now what I can do is I can, uh, right here, I can extract some samples uh, out, of the, out of the object. And these samples, if you notice what parameters are being followed right here, uh, those samples are uh, values of uh, gaytherm.test. So in other words, the parameters that I am following in this case are uh, exactly equal to uh, predicted values um, of the dependent variable in the test set. Right, so um, all I need to do is extract those parameters, right? So if I do a head on CV samples, what I should get is these are draws uh, of the predicted values of gaytherm.test, uh, each one corresponds to an iterate, each row corresponds to an inter iteration of the, mo of the Markov chain, each column corresponds to one of the 100 values in my test set. So if I do a dim on cv.samples, which is just coming out of this regression object, 
I have 100 columns, which 100 observations in my test set or my training set. No, my test set <laughs> and 2,000 observations in the rows corresponding to draws of the Markov chain. Uh, so here, this test mat is just, these are the true values of, um, of the value of gate theorem in the test set. Every row is just a repetition of the 100 values that are in the test uh, data set. Every column corresponds to a, a, a value in the, um, uh, 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 in the 100 data set, in the 100 observation test data set. So if I do a dim on test mat, it should be 2,000 rows corresponding to the 2,000 draws I'd like to compare to and 100 columns equivalent to the 100 observations in the test set. So now I can compare the cross-validation prediction samples that come out of the Markov chain and the true values in the data set to see how accurate they are. And ultimately what I'm going to be doing is comparing the samples from that from this model I just drew, which includes the black variable, to this other model right here, CV2, which doesn't include the black variable. So now what I need to do is let this model without the black variable sample for a little while, and then I can compare some prediction accuracies uh, statistics for the uh, model that includes the black variable and the model that doesn't and see essentially how much better the model does when I include the black variable in the, uh, in the model. Okay, sampling's complete. Uh, now what I can do is, what I wanna do is compare the draws, uh, the predicted draws of Y from the posterior predictive distribution for the test set to the true values that are in my test mat here. Uh, and then I wanna compute some various accuracy statistics. So in other words, how well did the model uh, predict uh, these out of sample observations? And then how well did one model do relative to another? So CV samples two, that's the model that does not include the black variable. Here's the model that does include the black variable. Is that right? So CV includes the black variable, CV2 doesn't. Okay, so this is the mean square error. So the difference between the prediction and the test, the true value in the test data set for the dependent variable, square that difference and then take the average value. And we can see that the model that does not include the black variable actually does slightly better in terms of root mean square error. So the sort of average squared deviance between, or deviation between the uh, actual value in the test set and the predicted value of y. Uh, actually not including the variable, the black variable, makes the model do a little bit better, which is kind of interesting. We could also think of looking not just at the mean square difference, but just raw bias. So this is just the average value of the gap between the true value and the predicted value in both models. And what do we see? The model that has um, black in it, the black variable in it, looks like the difference between the true value and the predicted value is about 2.6 on this 100 point scale of gate thermometer. Uh, without the variable, it's 2.4. And then we could also look at magnitude bias. So the absolute value of the gap between um, uh, the true value in the data set, the test data set, and the predicted, posterior predicted value. Uh, again, Here's the model with black. Here's the model without. The model without does only very slightly worse. And on the other two, um, and the other two criteria, it does actually quite a bit better. Well, quite a bit, a little better. So um, based on out of sample predictive capabilities, based on this 100 observation test set that we drew, uh, it actually appears uh, as though um, not including the black variable is actually a better better idea. Uh, I want to, um, before we move on to doing DIC, I want to caution, uh, there is a compromise embedded here. Um, whenever you uh, save out a test data set, obviously that's going to make your, um, your fitted model a little worse because you're taking data out of it. Um, so it's, it's always a little bit costly um, to do a test data set. And so, you know, for example, splitting your data in half and doing half as the test and half as the training 
uh, probably involves a little bit more of a compromise than what I did, which is, you know, I had about a thousand, about was it, about 2,000 observations roughly, and I took about 100. I took exactly 100 out. Um, that compromises a little less. But then again, uh, the smaller your test data set is, the more there's going to be sample to sample variability in exactly which test set you drew out, how that sort of works out to, to, uh, create, a, um, to create an accuracy metric. So if, if I was going to do this um, for real, uh, one thing I might do uh, is instead of Instead of just drawing one test data set, which I do right here, uh, I might create like 10, maybe 20 different combinations of training and test data and do this over and over again uh, to verify that my conclusions are not overly sensitive to whichever particular test set I chose, um, that it sort of stands up to different choices for the test set and the training data set. Um, the AIC is also... Uh, uh, in some cases, uh, approximates um, what would happen if you performed this kind of cross-validation leaving exactly one observation out. So uh, pull one observation out of the test data set, train on everything else, predict that one observation, then put that one back in the training, take the next one out, put it in the test, and just re repeat that process until you've done the entire data set. That, um, that works great, but it's very slow. Uh, leave one out cross validation is very very slow. So in pr in practice in a Bayesian statistics setting, we're probably not going to do it that often. Uh, all right. So I also mentioned you could do model comparison with DIC, uh, and then it's very easy. Uh, so all we need to do to compute DIC is use uh, the JAGS uh, built-in DIC samples function, and this is. For the first model, and this is for the second model, and I believe we need to tell it how many uh, samples to draw, and we can also specify the type of penalty to use. So let's see. PD is what I talked about in the lecture as being the type of penalty. There are other choices for that, but since to be consistent with the lecture, I'll say P, we're going to choose PD. Oh, it looks like they have curly quotes there. Uh, PD. Hmm. Ah, I realize my problem is regression.sim is the samples. Uh, the name of the actual regression or the object is, I think, reg.jags and then reg.2.jags. Okay, that should work. Yeah. Okay, so we'll run both of these, and then once they are uh, up here, we will restart. Hold on. Okay, so I've got both the deviance for the model that includes black, the deviance for the model that doesn't include black. Uh, the model with has a lower deviance than that without, which actually seems to, uh, and then there's the overall penalized deviance. So the penalized deviance here is what we should be comparing. The difference between the model with black and without black is one. <laughs> and so... If I'd use this, I, you notice I modified this code a little bit to actually save the DIC samples here and then calculate the, the difference in the DICs. It looks like the difference is essentially not statistically significant. <laughs> the sample standard error difference is nil. So um, what does that mean? Well, uh, the complexity parameter is penalizing us for having the, um, uh, the, uh, the black variable in there. Uh, but apparently it's, uh, so you can see the penalty is a little higher for that. Um, 
However, it looks like the overall deviance for the... Uh, actually, it looks like... Wait a minute. Usually, the, the lower DIC is the one you want, but... Uh, let's see. Yeah, even though it, even though it typically a negative value is actually a a, um, a sort of a smaller um, one is preferred. Yeah, a negative value indicates that DIC one is preferred. So DIC one is this, which is the model that has black in it. So the deviance is actually slightly smaller. So yeah, it's it's basically saying that the the model that includes um, that includes the black variable is uh, slightly preferred, um, but not much, <laughs> not to any significant degree. And if we go back to here, uh, the model that doesn't include uh, black actually seems to do a better job of uh, uh, predicting out of sample, at least in this particular test sample. So I would say the overall lesson here is black doesn't seem the black uh, race variable doesn't seem to be making a very big contribution. Um, uh, to anything. It's in other words, it's kind of a irrelevant variable. Um, it seems like a mostly irrelevant variable. Um, on the fence about whether it's a good idea to include it or not, but whether you include it or not doesn't seem to make a very big difference to either the deviance or to the out of sample prediction capabilities. We have uh, one more thing, uh, actually one and a half more things. Uh, we can try uh, to see whether um, it's a good idea to include this variable in the model. Uh, and that's uh, stochastic variable selection, uh, or Gibbs, Gibbs selection of variables. So now let's take a look at the same example using stochastic variable selection. Okay, so uh, now let's look at the um, stochastic variable selection and Gibbs variable selection approaches. And again, I'm going to point out this uh, paper by O'Hara and Salonpa, who can sort of fill you in on, on some of the um, background uh, references to more theoretical papers that explain exactly why this works in theory, in addition to working in practice, uh, and also talks about some of the limitations uh, and, and challenges and different techniques that have been developed to deal with those limitations and challenges of the procedure. And in particular, what I want to point out in this paper is that there are uh, several, um, three really um, strategies, separate strategies for variable selection. Um, that you can take. Uh, one is to uh, simply uh, put indicator variables on each uh, coefficient, let's say, in a regression, and then uh, let the uh, assign a prior to that indicator variable. So you can see here theta is i, j, b, beta, j. Um, i is the indicator variable. It's either a 1 or a 0, and beta is a, like a regression coefficient or some other parameter of interest. And then you assign separate priors to i, the indicator variable, and beta, the coefficient, uh, i is sort of a maybe a Bernoulli or, yeah, Bernoulli distribution or some other distribution. And uh, the, the point of it is um, to basically allow the betas to take on a value of exactly zero and allow the Gibbs sampler to figure out which variables ought to be zero and the probability with which they ought to be zero. Um, that is sort of one way of doing it. Um, unfortunately, it can cause... Um, essentially, you can see here, poor mixing, right? Which essentially the chain doesn't select um, I is zero or one enough um, because uh, you're not getting the right values of beta in order for uh, the, the um, I to actually s flip in the Gibbs sampler. It's a similar problem to the convergence problem that we mentioned a little earlier in this essay, or a little earlier in this, in this video, rather. Um, uh, another approach uh, is to, instead of um, I'm actually going to skip over this one, which involves a pseudo prior that helps to mix a little better. You can read about that on your own, but I want to talk about this SVS approach, um, which essentially moves the indicator from the from the beta to the tau, to the precision of beta. And the idea is, you can see here, the uh, precision of the coefficient depends on the presence of the of the indicator variable. And if the indicator variable is 1, 
um, you get uh, a, a particular precision, and if the indicator variable is zero, you get a different precision. And the idea is when the indicator variable is, say, flipped on, the precision is a normal precision, but when it's flipped off, the precision is incredibly low. So, I'm sorry, take that back, incredibly high. So, in other words, um, when the precision is incredibly high and the coefficient is centered on zero, so you can see here it's normally distributed around zero, when the precision is incredibly high, it's just basically going to say zero is the right choice. But when the indicator variable is, uh, uh, let's say, one, it's going to turn that precision into a normal precision and allow the sampler to sample freely from different values of the, um, of the, of the posterior. So this is sort of a, a, a kind of an application of Cromwell's rule, not exactly, um, but but related in the in the sense that you are setting the prior to be so specific and so powerful uh, that it essentially forces a coefficient to be uh, to be zero. Um, so that's option two. Uh, option three here is the uh, where's the yeah. Laplacian shrinkage, which is also known as the Bayesian lasso. And I've got, uh, hold on here. Where, where are you? Ah, there we are. Um, this paper by Park and Casella from uh, JASA on the Bayesian lasso. And this is something we talked about a little earlier. Uh, a Bayesian lasso is essentially uh, just a, uh, um, uh, it's just basically a prior um, that takes the form of like a Laplace distribution like this, which put a lot puts a lot of the uh, the concentration of the prior around zero. And uh, essentially, if if the beta is sort of near zero, it's small, the prior will shrink that coefficient towards zero. But if it's large, the prior won't be super informative. Uh, and so those are sort of three different techniques we might try. Uh, to decide uh, which variable uh, belong, which variables belong in a model, and with some of these uh, uh, techniques, for example, mon in model indicator techniques, you can also put indicators on the entire on an entire model. So you can basically say the same indicator for like five variables, and then a different indicator for five other variables, and those are sort of two blocks, and um, those blocks become models in essence. All right. So what does this look like in practice? Well. Um, we'll go through these things in order. So uh, we'll start off here with, um, this is an example of uh, sto uh, stochastic variable selection. Um, which I guess we're not going in order, are we? <laughs> we're starting with stochastic variable selection. Uh, putting the, um, putting the, uh, these model selection coefficients here. Um, you can see these model selection coefficients are distributed Bernoulli with some probability. Um, the probability is uh, I've assigned a relatively weak prior to this probability. So in other words, it's sort of, if you plot this beta distribution with parameters 1.5, 1.5, it's not quite uniform, but it's sort of a downward sloping, um, it sort of looks like a, like a bread loaf. Um, it sort of goes down near the, near the edges of P of 1 and P of 0, but a lot of coverage in between. And what this is saying is that the purport, uh, my prior belief about the proportion of variables um, that should actually be in this model is relatively weak, um, but uh, somewhere, you know, may probably not zero, probably not one, although some small probability of that, but somewhere in between. Uh, and then you can see these model selection coefficients go in to the tau function. So the tau for the age coefficient, the tau for the church coefficient, the tau for the party coefficient. This is the gay thermometer example from earlier, right? So it's just the same thing appearing again, except now what we have is basically two different, uh, we have we have the sort of the normal towels that we had before, and now we have this additional towel, which is just the normal towel plus a thousand times the model uh, indicator coefficient. So when basically when these switches are flipped on, what's gonna happen is this tau is going to get a lot more precise, and it's going to. And since these uh, age, church, party, female, and so on distributions are centered on zero, it's going to essentially force the coefficient to be almost exactly zero. And you can see I've also put um, a tau coefficient uh, uh, tau dot state dot m on the random effects distribution. So I'm going to allow uh, the random effects distribution to also sort of be flipped on or off in a similar way. Um, so uh, 
it's a, it's a relatively minor modification of the model we've already uh, run. Um, and what I'm going to do now, let's see, set that to the source. I'm going to run this uh, this uh, model, and the parameters I'm going to model uh, or I'm going to sample from the from the posterior distribution include M. M going back to here is this switch. And the switch determines whether the in this case the way it's written it determines whether the, the coefficient is definitely zero, that's m of one, or not zero, which is m turned off, m of zero. So by looking at the uh, looking at this m coefficient uh, sampled from the posterior, I should be able to get a sense. Hmm, oh, it's not called gay attitudes three. It's called gay attitudes s svs for stochastic variable selection, and I should be able to. Yeah, there we go sample from this. Uh, and so anyway, uh, going back to what I was saying before, I should be able to look at m um, and figure out the probability with which each variable is being selected into the, into the model. Um, <clears throat> so one thing to point out here is that I'm not comparing one big block of model coefficients to another. I'm eff effectively allowing any variable to enter or exit and then averaging in, averaging over all the possible space of possible models, uh, possible combinations of these coefficients. Um, so the, the probability I get out with M is not going to be, oh, the probability that it belongs in this particular kind of model, this particular structural model. It's averaging over all the possible combinations that are sampled over for these, how many coefficients do I have in this model? Uh, let's go back here. So I've got one, that's the, well, well A, that's always in there though. The uh, random effects, age, so one, two, three, four, five, six different coefficients, so I've got 6 choose 6 plus 6 choose 5 plus 6 choose 4 and so on, many possibilities uh, of models that I could be running. And the probability of inclusion uh, for a variable that's chosen by M is sampling over all those different possibilities. Okay, so let's do a summary on regression.sim. Okay, so looking at, I want to look at M. So I might have to use go back and use my code as a sort of a guide to figure out which one I should have maybe named these things, uh, but I used it just a generic index M. So M of one uh, tells me, bam, whether the random effects belong in there. And remember, a zero means they do, and a one means they don't. So going back to here, uh, there these are these are mean standard deviation, and then some irrelevant things. This is mean and standard deviation for m of one. It's always zero, which means it's essentially always choosing the random effects saw to be in the model. Okay, good to know. Um, okay, m of two is for age. Again, that always belongs in the model. m of three is for church attendance. And so it looks like there's a small probability about one and a half percent in my simulations that church attendance ought to be dropped from this model, averaging over the possible specifications. Okay, uh, four and five are party and female, they always belong. And then finally, we've got this uh, black coefficient, which we've talked about previously, is uh, not adding a lot to the out of sample predictive capabilities of the model. And stochastic variable selection is essentially telling me um, there's a 69.5% chance that the M is flipped off. In other words, that it's not um, it's it's not uh, selecting that variable into the model. So essentially, there's a pretty good chance uh, that this variable maybe doesn't is not sort of necessary to accurately fit the data. Okay. Um, so you, know, you can imagine I could I could do this for blocks of coefficients in order to compare one full model to another full model, right? Uh, I'd want to be careful about that. I wouldn't necessarily want both models to be running at the same time. Um, but, I, you know, sort of flipping between two whole sets of models, I could, I could do that. Okay, uh, so now let's talk about the uh, Bayesian lasso uh, procedure. Uh, the Bayesian lasso uh, works on a little different uh, principle. Oh, whoa. there we go. Oh. <laughs> works on a little different principle. Uh, than the stochastic variable selection or, or Gibbs variable selection. Um, <clears throat> essentially, instead of uh, uh, choosing a 
uh, a, um, a what you call it a, a model probability um, uh, that's uh, sort of low. Uh, I'm sorry, a model probability that allows a variable to be turned on or off. Uh, instead, as we discussed before, uh, what happens is you specify uh, Laplace distribution. You specify a Laplace distribution uh, around um, around each uh, beta coefficient, and, and that Laplace distribution with, will tend to uh, shrink um, unnecessary variables toward uh, zero. So you'll see um, zero basically being uh, occurring more frequently um, in your uh, Monte Carlo estimates than you would without this so-called regularization procedure. And uh, the idea comes from, uh, among other places, this article by Park and Casella called the Bayesian Lasso. And what you can see that they tell you to do here is to specify uh, regression parameters having independent and identical Laplace or double exponential priors. Um, on your uh, for all your coefficients. So if I come down here, here's my uh, gay thermometer um, uh, gay thermometer model again. Uh, what you can see is I've got my regression. All the stuff uh, is as it was before. I've got my black and my female um, additional parameters in here, sort of added on from the earlier model. I took away again the you know all the other stuff, the um, random slopes. Uh, and uh, the, the group level predictor for the random intercepts. Uh, but what I have got right here, and actually particularly right here, you can see that now all these parameters are distributed um, DDEXP, or for double exponential, with means of zero and lambdas of tau.las. And tau.las is right here distributed gamma 0 0.001, 0 0.001. This is the, this parameter here is the lambda parameter, um, or actually I think it might be one over lambda, but whatever. It's the, um, it's the regularization parameter. And it's important, you may notice, that all of these, um, all of these coefficients actually have independent but identical distributions. They all share the lambda parameter. That lambda parameter is gonna basically draw um, all the coefficients uh, towards zero if <clears throat> they're sort of in the vicinity of zero, if that makes sense. If their true values are near zero, they're going to be zeroed out. Um, and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this right here. Uh, I'm going to estimate this model, and I'm going to track uh, the lambda parameter. And actually, it's not actually called lambda. It's called tau.las. So I'll go ahead and save it as tau.las. <clears throat> I'm going to track that parameter along with all the coefficients uh, and I'm gonna, you know, essentially see whether any of my uh, any of my uh, coefficient variables here get zeroed out. So uh, this is a model that should take a little while to run. Yeah, it's even taking a little while to initialize. So what I'll do is I'll pause the video, let this run, and then we'll come back when we can look at the results. <clears throat> okay, so the uh, uh, the uh, Markov chain completed. Here's some diagnostic uh, simulations I've got here. And uh, you notice, or you may remember before, the stochastic variable selection procedure uh, focused uh, on um, and only identified one variable as being a potentially re removable. That was the black co coefficient on black. Uh, and you can see here we've got essentially no variance on zero other than just the normal kind of variance here. So that suggests to me, everything else looks kind of okay, that suggests to me that... Uh, Based on these results, I would want to probably include all these variables uh, in the model. I think that makes sense. Now, we might get different answers uh, if we changed um, some aspect of the of the model in some way. Maybe, it, for example, uh, I could make the the distribution of tau dot last, basically the lambda parameter, you know, more concentrated on one or something, uh, and and then it would. Is if I concentrated it more on a particular value, maybe it would be uh, more likely to more strongly regularize. It's a possibility. Uh, but based on the model we ran here, looks like it wants to include uh, all of the different all the different parameters. Okay, uh, that's it for this lecture. Uh, thanks very much, and uh, we'll see you next time.